Hello there. In this video, I would like to present this book here, Construction Grammar and its Application to English. It's an introductory textbook on construction grammar, and it just came out with the Edinburgh University Press. So, if you have five minutes or so, um, there are three things that I want to do in this video. First of all, I will explain what this book is about, Construction Grammar. Um, since you're watching this video, chances are you already know a thing or two about construction grammar, but some people might not, and so if you're an expert, bear with me, this won't take long. Um, second, I will explain what topics are covered in this book. What can you expect to get out of it? And lastly, how can you get uh, an inspection copy if you're teaching a linguistics class? Um, well, and you're wondering, maybe this is something uh, that I can use <clears throat> you can get an examination copy for free and check whether the book in fact meets your expectations. All right, so without further ado, um, what's this book about? Well, it's about construction grammar, evidently, and construction grammar is a linguistic theory. It is a theoretical model of what speakers know when they know a language. And what this theory tries to explain is how knowledge of language is organized in speakers' minds. What is it that you have to know so you can produce language, like I do now, and understand language, like you are doing right now? Now, evidently, you have to know lots and lots of stuff. You have to know words, what they mean, how they sound, how they are put together, how they are furnished with morphological affixes, and, um, well, <clears throat> how they are put together to form phrases and sentences, all of that. And the central and radical claim of construction grammar is that knowledge of language really isn't a lot of things, rather it's just one thing, um, namely knowledge of linguistic units that connect a form and a meaning. Units that connect a form and a meaning are called constructions, hence the name construction grammar. And so when you know a language, that knowledge of yours really is a large network of constructions. The idea that linguistic knowledge is really nothing more than just a network of constructions is quite a bold claim, and it is one that sets construction grammar apart from most other linguistic theories that are currently on the market. Okay, many of you knew that already. Um, what is special about this book and what is in it that might make it worth your time. So first of all, notice that it's called Construction Grammar and its application to English. So in addition to a description of construction grammar as such, you get a grand tour of English grammar and English grammatical constructions. In addition, um, for each of the nine chapters in the book, I have recorded a video lecture that goes over the main ideas. Um, you can click on the links here um, to get to those videos. And if you want to watch them later, you can just go to YouTube, search for my name and construction grammar, and the videos will come up. Okay, um, back to the book. What happens in the nine chapters? The introductory chapter um, explains and motivates the constructional approach, and I give some definitions of what constructions are, and I discuss a few tricks that you can use to identify constructions. Chapter 2 is about argument structure constructions, which are simple sentence patterns such as John baked Mary a cake or John hammered the metal flat. Um, they seem straightforward and simple, but they're actually very important to construction grammar because they show that also uh, syntactic patterns are meaningful symbolic units. Chapter 3 um, discusses how constructions are interrelated and interlinked in your knowledge of language, in that network of constructions. So when you know a language, you know lots and lots of constructions, and those constructions are mutually interlinked. They're not just like a big box of Lego blocks where it's just a big mess of stuff. Rather, there is structure in that network of constructions. Chapter 4 focuses on morphological constructions. Most work in construction grammar has focused on syntax, how words are put together to form phrases and sentences, but there's in fact very interesting work on how complex words and their component parts can be understood as constructions. Chapter 5 moves on to the pragmatic side of construction grammar. So there are many syntactic constructions in English that have special pragmatic properties. For instance, if you're talking to a friend 
and you use a so-called WH cleft construction, such as what John lost was his wallet. You make a number of assumptions about what your friend does and does not know at that point in the conversation. So if you think about it, um, the sentence, what John lost was his wallet, is a very odd sentence to start a conversation with. All right, um, chapter six. Uh, in chapter six, I'll go over research that motivates the constructional approach with evidence from language processing. So this is about psycholinguistic work that has gathered evidence for construction grammar on the basis of experiments that look at language comprehension on the one hand and language production on the other hand. <clears throat> Chapter 7 looks at another type of psycholinguistic evidence, namely evidence from language acquisition. Some of the best evidence, in my view, that we have for the constructional approach comes from studies that investigate how children learn language in an item-based piecemeal fashion, and that's what I explain in that chapter. Right, um, chapter 8 focuses on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, namely language variation and change. So your knowledge of constructions includes knowledge of variation. Constructions are no static or fixed entities, but rather um, there's variation within constructions and there is typically more than one way of using a construction and you as a speaker know about this variation. So you know when one variant of a construction is more appropriate than another. Right, uh, chapter nine then is the conclusion and it points out a few topics for future research, which you know, stuff that you could be doing. Okay, so that's been a quick rundown of what is there in the book. Um, on to the third point, how can you get a free examination copy? So one way is to go to the EUP website, that will be euppublishing.com, and then you can look for my name and the book will come up. Um, and here on this page, you see there, there is a small writer saying inspection copy. There you can enter your name and address and uh, the book will be on its way. Unfortunately, this does not work if you live in the Americas. So if you're in America and you would like an inspection copy, um, email me and I'll see what I can do. Okay, in the States, um, the book is distributed by Oxford University Press, but I checked the Oxford webpage and the book isn't on there yet. It might be there soon, but to be safe, email me and I'll see what I can do. Okay, um, now some of you may wonder why I haven't published this book with an open source publisher such as Language Sciences Press. Um, then all of you would have had the book for free immediately and I realize I probably should have done that. Uh, but the way it happened is that um, Heinz Giegelich, the, the series editor for EUP, asked me if I wanted to write this book and basically I was, I was too flattered to say no and before I knew it I, I had signed a contract and so <clears throat> well, my bad. Next time, I know better. Um, but on the upside, you know, the, the paperback is about 20 euros, 1999. And so in all likelihood, uh, no one will get rich with this book, um, unfortunately, perhaps, and, and no one will go broke either, hopefully. And uh, you can also watch the, the YouTube videos for free, and you'll probably learn just as much as if you read the book. Yeah, so watch the videos. Now, if you have questions or comments, you're very welcome to um, contact me either in the comments section or by email. And a few people have actually already emailed me about the videos and, and that always brings a smile to my face. So thank you for doing that. Um, you know who you are. All right, um, lastly, um, many of you will be aware that Chuck Fillmore, um, one of the key architects behind construction grammar, recently passed away. And it simply wouldn't be appropriate to do this video and, and not mention Chuck Fillmore, who's had a central role in the development of construction grammar and in fact linguistics at large. So I, I met Chuck Fillmore in 2007 when I was doing a postdoc uh, in his FrameNet project in Berkeley. And um, well, I have to say, I didn't get to know him very well, of course, I was only there for a year. But in the few conversations that we had, um, I, I really 
well, the conversation exemplified all the good things that I had heard about him. And it's really not my place to describe Chuck Fillmore to you. There are people who have known him for years and they're in a much better position. But I will say that there are very few linguists that are as revered and respected as Chuck Fillmore. And our discipline really owes him a lot. And we can be very thankful for the ideas that he has left us. Um, that's perhaps a sad note to, to end the video with, but, but then again, I think a life that ends with such a great intellectual legacy, I think that's actually a very uplifting and, and wonderful idea, and it gives us something to aspire to. And with that thought, I would like to leave you. Bye.